This is Christopher Cernike, hosting episode 23 of season 2 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Did you know that there are people that live on the moon? That's right, we miss them. The moon, by the way, is actually made of cheese. Swiss cheese, to be exact. The craters on the moon aren't actually caused by impact. In actuality, just like with the Swiss cheese we have here on Earth, the holes, or eyes as cheese connoisseurs would say, on the moon are caused by bacteria producing the byproduct of carbon dioxide which produces air pockets that form the eyes on our cheesy moon. Now, if you are still listening, I hope that you know I'm merely jesting. The moon is not Swiss cheese. Actually, according to space.com, children's fairy tales tell us the moon is made of cheese. But like all bodies in the solar system, rock is the more realistic ingredient. In fact, the moon is a dusty rock. According to Forbes author Elizabeth Howell, NASA has asked several companies to collect moon dust for future use by astronauts on the moon. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, what exactly would NASA want with moon dust? According to Howell, moon dust could support habitat building for future astronaut missions. Lunar dust could be used for constructing structures, for example, which would reduce the need to ship building materials from Earth. But testing needs to be performed in collecting dust before NASA can certify the habitats for construction. Now, why would NASA use moon dust as a component in the out-of-this-world structures they plan on making. NASA has already satisfied our curiosity. The organization said, resupply missions are expensive, and as astronauts' crews become more independent of Earth, sustained exploration becomes more viable. For travel in space, as on Earth, we need practical and affordable ways to use resources along the way rather than carrying everything we think will be needed. So it's amazing that someday, possibly in the near future, human beings are going to live on the moon, or perhaps even on other planets, like Mars. Now, did you know that at one point, there actually was a great moon hoax about life on the moon? In 1835, an article published by the New York Sun claimed that a British astronomer, Sir John Herschel, had discovered intelligent life on the moon. The New York Sun article claimed that there were lilac-colored pyramids, herds of bison, and blue unicorns that lived on the moon. Now, Sir John Herschel had never made such claims, and this article was exposed as a fraud. And speaking of fraud, According to a PLOS-1 article, the frequency with which scientists fabricate and falsify data or commit other forms of scientific misconduct is a matter of controversy. Another paper on PublicMed.gov said, Scientific research typically has been founded on high ethical standards established by researchers in academia and healthcare research institutions. This same paper went on to define scientific fraud as an act of deception or misrepresentation of one's own work. Continuing on the subject of fraud, on the Genesis Under a Microscope program, I covered how Ernest Haeckel, an evolutionist from the 1800s, used fraud to support his ideas. Haeckel's claim was essentially that the human embryo in the womb 
goes through a rerun of the supposed evolutionary history of man from a primitive life form to a human being. Haeckel had a set of 24 drawings which he claimed showed eight different embryos in three stages of development. However, Michael Richardson, an embryologist at St. George's Hospital Medical School, has exposed these drawings to be fraudulent. According to Richardson, Haeckel fudged the scale to an exaggerate similarities among species, even when there were tenfold differences in size. Haeckel further blurred differences by neglecting to name the species in most cases, as if one representative was accurate for an entire group of animals. Richardson has a photo where he shows that Haeckel's drawings, which can be seen on top, look nothing like what the real embryos do. One would hope that the evolutionary community would totally reject this fraudulent information and especially not teach this in schools to children since it's false information. However, Carl Sagan, a popular atheist and evolutionary cosmologist, taught this information in his book, The Dragons of Eden. Richard Peacock on evolutionfaq.com lists common traits in embryos as a proof of evolution. And even the Princeton Review, a company which is supposed to help students to study for their AP exams, like AP Biology, states, if you look at the early stages in vertebrate development, all the embryos look alike. Chemist Russell Grigg, writing for Creation Ministries International, wrote, most informed evolutionists in the past 70 years have realized that the recapitulation theory is false. So thankfully, there are honest evolutionists who will acknowledge when they are wrong or misinformed. Creationists should likewise maintain that same mindset. I really appreciated these comments from Dr. Carl Wieland, who wrote, when an evolutionist publishes his or her research results, my first assumption is that these have been honestly reported. Even though there has been so much fraudulent activity among evolutionist researchers, such as the Haeckel embryo fraud, I recognize that it is still a minority phenomena, and I do not unfairly tar all evolutionists with the same brush. Integrity has to be number one, or all we do is for nothing. I have long said that creationism or creation science should not be seen as some sort of separate thing. It is about Christ, the Bible, the gospel, and the entire authority of the word, which is all about truth, justice, integrity, etc. Remember that moon dust we talked about earlier? At one point in time, creation scientists used to claim that the amount of dust on the moon based on uniformitarian assumptions, was in too low of a quantity for the moon to be as ancient as it is claimed to be. However, in keeping with principles of integrity, when new data emerges, creation scientists such as Dr. Andrew Snelling re-examined the moon dust argument and found it wanting. CMI has a webpage called Arguments We Think Creationists Should Not Use. The second argument listed is the moon dust argument. This article summarizes the situation quite nicely, saying, For a long time, creationists claim that the dust layer on the moon was too thin if dust had truly been falling on it for billions of years. They base this claim on early estimates by evolutionists of the influx of moon dust and worries that the moon landers would sink into this dust layer. But these early estimates were wrong and by the time of the Apollo landings, NASA was not worried about sinking. So the dust layer thickness can't be used as proof of a young moon or of an old one either. Dr. Andrew Snelling and David Rush wrote a great article on this subject. Robert Brown of the Geoscience Research Institute wrote, the publication of moon dust and the age of the solar system is a major contribution to credible scientific creationism. By the way, before we close, there's another question that's begged by all of this. How can we, whether we be scientists or lay people, 
maintain our integrity when the Bible clearly says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Thankfully, the Bible does not leave us to solve this problem on our own. God promises that he will give us a new heart. The word of God says, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. The Apostle Paul puts it quite nicely. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. My desire for you viewers is that you are saved. So please give your heart to Christ Jesus today. And for those interested in learning more about biblical creation, please check out Creation Ministries International, the Institute for Creation Research, the Geoscience Research Institute, Answers in Genesis, the Biblical Science Institute, Biblical Genetics, and Christ Jesus Ministries. There are so many more great creation organizations out there. And because I didn't want to leave anyone out, the description of the video shows you how to access dozens of other creation organizations and see lists of scientists who support biblical creation. There are also two free books, multiple articles, and a video from Dr. Jason Lyle and an interview of Dr. Danny Faulkner explaining creation astronomy. You can also see the scientific papers referenced throughout this video and the other episodes of current topics in science that covered astronomy related topics. Thank you very much for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.